You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome. I'm Kenneth Igbomo. On today's show, we'll discuss Nigeria's real estate prospects and you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Market and follow our conversation online. You can hit me at my handle at Kenneth Ibomo. Now, Nigeria's real estate sector has contracted since 2016 with the sector down 4.7% as at the full year of 2018. That's according to the National Bureau of Statistics. Joining me to discuss the prospect of real estate in Nigeria is Damilola Akindolire. He's the Managing Director at Alpha Made Development Company. Thank you so much for joining me today, Damilola. I'd just first like to get what your expectations for the real estate sector will look like in this year. Bearing in mind, bearing in mind that we just got a new, pre well, same president, but with a new strategy. Oh, thanks, Ken. Um, well, we begin first. The re-election of the president has, uh, would help stabilize the economy in terms of policy continuity. So some of the initiatives that the government has initially uh, has put in place will begin to rear and mature fruits. That's been one of my biggest concerns. Um, so I expect to see a buoyant industry. Um, I expect to see the real estate fully recover from uh, the recession. Um, we've seen how the construction industry has uh, has been able to overcome and even outgrow the uh, outgrow our GDP. Uh, growth. Uh, the construction industry has come out from recession and is currently growing at about 2% uh, compared to about uh, GDP growth of 1.98. So it's even outperformed uh, GDP, GDP growth. So with those signs begin to sh you know, point us in a direction that the real estate uh, industry is not far from um, it's not far from getting back to the, the bride of the, of the economy. All right, but it's a good thing you mentioned the economic growth because I'm looking at, you know, projecting into the future, if we see much stronger growth in there, what does this mean for the real estate sector? Or how can the real estate sector take advantage of that economic growth? A much stronger real estate industry is definitely good for the economy because uh, the real estate uh, industry is one of the largest contributors of labor and workforce in the country. So what you expect to see is a boiled real estate industry would increase, uh, reduce the level of unemployment, um, which also has several uh, social economic effects, including security and so on. So um, the industry itself has to be organized in such a way that it can take advantage of these initiatives. And uh, more importantly is that the players uh, need to have more market awareness as to some of the initiatives that governments is putting in place so that the people you are making policy for can also uh, find ways to uh, access and tap into those opportunities. Otherwise, the policies will just be as good as the papers they are written. But, but what do you think is that disconnect, though? So basically, the one of the real the real problems of uh, the real estate economy is that there is a complete disconnect uh, between the two sides of the divide. And when I mean the divide, I mean both the demand and the supply side. Um, so what I see happening more often now is that uh, the government is putting a lot of you know, focus and initiatives on the, um, on the demand side, but not really also thinking of how the supply would match up with the demand. And that can uh, become a problem if you have too much of a strong demand in the industry and then you're unable to match that with supply, then that's what you begin to see like what's happening in the U.S. now where they've come out from a subprime crisis now to very high elevated housing prices mm -hmm. crisis. So what you need to solve now is to begin to look at what are the supply elements that we can, you know, the CBN, all the government processors and institutions can begin to intervene in okay. to ensure that that balance is maintained. All right then, but when you look at, the, look into the, the next four years though, what segments would you want to watch out for? Would you advise people to watch out for? Um, the real estate subsectors um, are currently um, quite an interesting uh, area. Um, I don't expect to see very strong comeback on the retail side for uh, one simple reason is that one, uh, disposable income is still quite very low, uh, still at moderate levels. So I don't expect to see a huge demand for foreign appetites or foreign uh, demand for goods. Um, the exchange rate is still also quite high. Um, so that is a major influencer. Uh, that drives the retail industry. But I expect to see more informal uh, retail concepts coming to the markets um, like we used to have back in the days. You have more shopping complex. Uh, people want to do business in a convenient 
and and a very uh, in a convenient environment. So they would rather like you know in the office uh, subsector space where you have grade A and grade B. What you begin to see now is that you begin to see more of grade B shopping malls uh, or shopping complexes, as the case may be. I think that's where we see I see a lot of strong demand on the industrial outlook. Um, the warehousing subsector looks very strong. The yields are probably the highest across all the subsectors as we speak. I expect to see that strong maintenance going up. The, uh, uh, the manufacturing index is still quite high. So we expect to still see a strong run in that space. So it's a space to, to watch out for. On the residential space, um, again, except all these policies are able to come together to you know, connect effectively, um, we will continue to still see some struggle in that space. And on the office side, uh, we have good news recently. Um, a recent research report shows that vacancy ratios are beginning to drop uh, in Ikoyi and VI for grade A assets. Um, that could be as a result of many factors, which could be renewed confidence in the economy. And it could also be as a result of reduction in, in, uh, in tenant rates. All right then, when, but I still wanted to go back to the retail because I, I think it still has more more um, opportunities for growth beyond the international brands. Can local players in this place come out and say, you know what, this model has worked here. This model has worked here. Can we try and emulate and build more sub shopping malls? Because we know that there's still a huge deficit of shopping malls in Nigeria. Yeah, the whole concept really. It's um, if you look at the capital outlay for a shopping mall, um, it's quite huge. Um, and there are definitely local brands that are matching up to uh, take position, and they want to better. They want better representation of their brands in um, in these uh, very well organized spaces. But the question is, for example, the Novare Mall, which is at the Shangu Tedo area of uh, Lekki, Lagos. It's uh, it's an eighty million dollar investment. So I'm not sure with the industry in uh, in a negative uh, recession at the moment and. I don't think that kind of industry can attract that size of capital. You know, even if there is a demand for local players who may want uh, to take position in some of the Yeah, because I'm looking at some local players like, like Ebino and a couple of others who have a smaller strategy, but then they are, they are, they are putting, putting, place, are, are putting shops across the place. Across the place. I, I want to believe some other people can take advantage of this. Yes, more neighborhood malls will become more effective. Like I said, you know, the two issues that drive construction of malls, uh, you know, it's a more of a, a capital outlay play and also more of a, a, a considered what I'll call strong brand play in terms of the retail, uh, uh, retail outlets. So what you'd expect to see is you no longer see large size malls of 20,000, 24,000, uh, square meters anymore like we used to. We saw that trajectory or that trend. You know, you now see more neighborhood malls where you have shop rights willing to take uh, smaller spaces between 5,000 and 7,000 compared to, um, you know, what they used to have in the past. So that's the future of the retail industry. You now begin to bring in the malls uh, closer to uh, the parties along the entire lucky stretch of uh, almost uh, 30 kilometers plus. You only have uh, three, four major malls on that stretch, and that's, uh, that's a corridor that has well over six million people on it. So these are the factors that you need to consider, that the capital, the industry is still very weak. Disposable income is not strong enough to demand for such a huge it's capital outlay. Yeah. So neighborhood malls uh, would continue to take precedence in any investments, and they do very well. Um, given the outlook of some of the names and the brands you've mentioned. All right, then let's get into the other part, which I'm also very, very interested about, very much interested about. It's the first time Omona in Nigeria. Mm. You know, when you look at that first, you, probably a young person who's got a job and is trying to take some part of his in income, set that aside to, with, the, with the hopes of owning, owning a home in Nigeria, what are the biggest hurdles they face? Um, first, the first time Omona's has many hurdles. Um, one of them is the price of assets uh, within uh, 30 minutes to a one-hour stretch from uh, any central business district or what I would call place of work. Um, so Nigeria doesn't really have a, a workforce uh, accommodation strategy that allows us to move uh, workers in and out of central business districts to allow them to contribute effectively uh, in terms of productivity and, uh, and their man hours. So they spend quite a lot of time 
uh, you know, unproductive hours, you know, because of the infrastructure deficits riding between where they stay or where they can afford and where their employers or uh, their office locations are. So for the first time home buyers, pricing uh, and location is a problem for them. Um, that's the first thing. And then secondly, um, because Nigeria is not, uh, they're not really a cash driven, um, these first time home buyers are not people that have savings that allow them to make outright purchases. So what that also constrains them is they have no option but to lean on the mortgage industry uh, to, to, to get some support. And with mortgage rates in the elements of 22-24%, um, it means that a house would double its value every five years. You know, that's the implication. So if uh, a first-time home buyer were to buy a house of 20 million in 2019, by 2024, with that mortgage rate, the value of that house would have become 40 million. You know, so it's a very difficult task for home first-time home buyers to catch up because they always would see this, um, you know, this leap, uh, this leap continue, uh, you know, across okay. their work life cycle. So that's the two main issues I think the government. But, but the solve. picture you're painting right now is looking like the afford the term affordable housing is a myth. So affordable housing is relative, um, and that's where we industry players need to understand what does affordable housing mean. Affordable housing is not social housing. You know, social housing is um, solely the prerogative of governments to provide low-cost accommodation to house those who do not have the means to fend for themselves. And they don't necessarily have to own them, they could also be rented. So social housing doesn't necessarily translate to ownership. It could be uh, on a rent basis. Um, affordable housing for the middle class is different in the sense that um, the expectation in the past where we used to think people would live in houses of 5 to 10 million, it's no longer feasible because the cost of land alone in Nigeria is almost 20-30% of the cost of housing. So we need to become realistic with our expectations to understand that the affordable housing chain is relative and for first time home buyers, for the comfort of them and their families, we must be looking at houses beyond the 15 million naira point. All right then, but it brings me to the point of you know plugging the deficit in the in the housing sector in Nigeria. We've had different numbers bandied around from 17 million to about 20 million housing units, you know, the deficit. But when you look at the problem on, on on ground, how do you think we can better plug this deficit? So this has to be a two-pronged approach um, because the government has a very huge role to play and. Um, like I say, there's always two sides of the divide, the demand and the supply side. I think on the, on the demand side, they, we need to begin to see mortgage subsidies kicking. You know, um, I'm aware that CBN has a program now that is in the offing and hopefully should become public soon. Um, that allows us, that allows first time home buyers to see their mortgage interest rates come down from the highs of 23, 24 to somewhere in the 12% range. Um, I mean, 12% is the effective rate you need for a first time home buyer to maintain a mortgage with one third percent, a third of his salary. Uh, that's the effective rate that a uh, you know, first time home buyer needs to uh, maintain. And for that reason, if you begin to see mortgage subsidies kick in that allows first time home buyers get to 12%, in terms of the mortgage interest rates, we will begin to see very strong demand in that space. And then on the, also, uh, still relating to the demand side, some policy intervention needs to become active. We've always spoken about the issue of pension funds, um, having people access 25% of their retired savings accounts. We now need to see these actions become effective in the market. And that would also galvanize that space to create effective demand. And then on the supply side, um, I think the real estate industry needs to have a bit of more sector-focused fund. Um, I know the government has introduced what we call the family home fund, which uh, was expected to help um, take us to that El Dorado space. But the family home fund would only create demand for the product by buying act assets of developers. What it would not do is to help us resolve some structural defects that exist with our supply chain. So if we're to put in 10,000 housing units together today in a particular location, um, it could drive up even the cost of, uh, of nail or nets, you know, because the, there's a very dysfunctional uh, supply chain uh, system in place, which has led to very high imports. And when you have to rely on high imports at 350 naira or 359 naira per dollar, then it simply means that the cost of housing will still not be affordable.
And that was Damilola Akindolire. He is the managing director at Alpha Maid Development Company. If you're just joining us, I've been speaking to Damilola Akindolire. He's the managing director at Alpha Maid Development Company. And we're discussing the prospect of real estate in Nigeria. But One part I want to look at is also how we can get this the informal sector involved, you know, through via mortgages. We've seen a couple of schemes come out, you know, and I'd like you to lend a word on this. Clearly, the informal sector is the largest sector, subsector in the Nigeria real estate space. Um, so, if you look at the total active mortgage today, um, we're still under 100,000. And that's because the focus of mortgages has been on, you know, um, the employed and self-employed. So, if you bring in, widen the net, and you bring in the informal sector into the mortgage bracket, uh, what we expect to see is an exponential growth in the mortgage sector that we, uh, and that will give us, take us to where we ought to be. Uh, the informal sector con makes up more than 60% of our population. So by the time you are able to have a market trader or a uh, tire repair come into the mortgage industry, I feel that's the space we need to be. And it is not new in our economy. We've had um, some microfinance bank um, move along this line. And the feedback from that industry is that the default rate is, is quite very low. So what we expect to see is a very, very robust and active sector. And that's why the NMRC has moved from creating, working with uh, the Mortgage Banks Association of Nigeria and the Mortgage Banks, moved from creating the writing standards for self-employed and employed. Now they have now created an underwriting standard for the informal sector. So I see this as a major game changer for the industry. And then we begin to see uh, the mortgage expansion and mortgage home ownership rise in Nigeria to compare with uh, its peers in the sub-Saharan. Okay, but do you think having this segment, you know, captured, you know, helps our definition of that affordable housing? Typically, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, um, you know, home ownership in Nigeria is currently uh, less than 2%. And the 98% of these people, the bulk of them, are in the informal sector. So, um, the, like I say all the time, the demand and the supply side must be considered in any uh, sector you look at. So, if you create supply um, in that sector, there will definitely be demand. But in this case, the informal on the writing standard, the informal sector on the writing standard will help create a demand. However, we now, now need to think of how do we create supply for houses that will be sub 10 million to meet the expectations of people in this industry. So I, I really think um, quite a lot of work has gone into the supply side, the demand side, and similar effort must go into the supply side to make it uh, effective. Effective. Okay, but then I'd like to look at it now from the sub-national level and see how we can have a strategy within this state, each state, to try to cater to plug the housing deficit because we understand that the demands for per state is different. Clearly, um, that's a very valid point, Ken. You see, people have always mentioned this housing deficit as a national crisis. But, you know, when you have a population growth in excess of 3% and an urbanization rate in excess of 3.5%, you now begin to deal with the housing crisis in major cities uh, like Lagos, uh, Port Harcourt, Abuja. So, therefore, the strategy to tackle the housing crisis in those environments would differ from uh, the kind of strategy you need to solve housing crisis in Kwara or Kogi or any of the rural, uh, you know, uh, states in, in the country. So... A sub-national strategy to really articulate, understand the shortage in each... And it can be done from different perspectives. It can be done at a region level. Because if we do understand that, for example, Lagos is a hub, and we're able to begin to solve the housing crisis outside the, uh, uh, the peripherals of Lagos State, we can still solve housing crisis in Lagos. And that's why you've seen the spillover effect of our housing demand to the likes of Muwe, to the likes of Ota to the likes of Papalanto and so on and so forth. So government needs to begin to look at these um, informal strategies that have self-involved as a result of demand and begin to take them more seriously and at a sub-national level think of how do we solve this housing crisis at either at the regional level and also at a state, a state level. But a sub-national strategy is required to tackle this housing crisis head on. Evan, even speaking further on that, I would like to look at how collaboration between government and private sector can have more um, exchange you know, of ideas and, you know, and how they can work together to plug this deficit. Because I, I, when I look at the numbers, it's huge. And um, it also opens up opportunities. 
as a matter of fact, if you even take the figure of 17 million housing deficit and an average home price of, uh, of 5 million, we're talking in trillions. You know, so the, the market is huge and sizable and it's scalable. The challenge is that each government needs to work out its own solution. And the challenge currently is the fact that there's no data to give us the footprint to say in Ondo State, for example, the housing deficit here is 300 or 500,000. Over the next 20 or next 10 years, we would supply 2,000 houses per Per, you know, per year, and then begin to devise land subsidy strategy key into the housing mortgage subsidy, and then those are now what we can say would become intervention points where state governments can adopt national strategies at sub-local level to address housing crisis that pertains to their states. And that is also one of the incentives the federal government can put in place to help evolve the housing situation where we can draft a national framework, and that that framework, uh, state governments will get incentives for also uh, bringing down elements of putting index like such as administ administering land more efficiently, um, tax subsidies on uh, housing related products, um, sub mortgage subsidies to allow for civil servants and, um, and you know, people in the informal sector to come on board. So once the fragment can define the broad national strategy, the state government should have incentives to key into that broad national strategy, rather what you have in the past where the federal government tries to dictate mm. to the states on how they think they should manage their housing crisis. I think what the federal government should stick to is defining policy and putting mm. enough incentives on the table to allow for the state government, who are the custodians of land, to begin to drive this, uh, this strategy forward. So because more cohesion between the federal government and the states. Yes, and that is, it is when you have that kind of collaboration that the private sector can now come on board. You know, that's the only way it can happen. So you have a disconnect with the federal government having very good lofty programs. You have the state government who is in custody of the land, who's not part of that program. And then we are now forced to begin to replicate uh, these federal government initiatives across the country rather than trying to define the issues on a state-by-state -state basis and then preferring solutions as the case may be and then bringing in the private sector to take it forward. All right, but when you look at how policy formulation for the housing sector over the years, do you think there has been enough involvement or consultation with the private sector or businesses that are very involved in, in housing? I think the challenge, there has been, I must confirm that, because um, I've participated in quite a lot of, a lot of forums, but the real challenge here is that there's a disconnect trying to ensure one should fit all. That's really been the, the bane of the issue. So we're trying to use the solution in Shukoto to solve the housing crisis in Lagos. So that will always be the problem, where we sit in Lagos formulate a lot of strategy and not understand how that effect, how that you know would impact the man in Kano. So those are some of the issues that we need to uh, look into clearly. That housing policy cannot be driven at a national level. It must come to a sub-national level where the players and key decision makers can take advantage and connect more efficiently. All right, then when I look at the challenges of owning a home, first I look at the cost of land in Nigeria. If I, and you, when you compare it, compare it, just the cost of land alone in Nigeria can actually get you a property in some parts of the world, right. you know, complete property. And then, do you think we're ripe for, for some sort of mortgage subsidy, especially even for land as well? Yes, I, I do sincerely think because there are some factors that are well outside uh, control. For example, the current NPR is in the range of 14% uh, or so. Um, that automatically makes cost of fund more expensive, naturally. Um, the exchange rate is currently at 358. Um, that also makes housing more expensive, given that 40% of the housing uh, components are imported. Um, so by the time you look at the effects of the unintended effects, and the reason why you cannot bring down NPR is because you also are trying to control inflation and also money in circulation. I mean, I saw in the, the power launch that the CBN plans to raise a trillion from the capital markets uh, over the next, in line with its debt program. What that simply means is that uh, companies like ours would not, would not be able to go to the same market, raise funds at very competitive rates. If the government of Nigeria is currently borrowing at 15-16%, then you can expect that companies like Alpha Mid will be borrowing at 20-21%. So there must be a cushion effect you know, that helps to balance the high rates of cost of funds, 
cost of material, and then we need to bring it down to the element of land. So where land subsidy exists, it helps to shave off uh, some of this very strong exposure that we're having with high rates of funds and high uh, rates of high import dependent uh, components. I've been speaking to Damilola Akindolire. He's the managing director at Alpha Made Development Company. And that's it on Beyond Markets. Thank you for joining us. Remember, you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West Africa time daily and have access to all previous episodes of Beyond Markets on our website at cnbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets and follow me at Kenneth Do have a wonderful day.